Thank you, choir. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Matthew 5, 13. Last week we started uh, the fifth chapter of Matthew, which is a three-chapter uh, segment on the Sermon on the Mount as we go through the, the whole book of Matthew. We had just started the Sermon on the Mount last week where he talked about the Beatitudes or the blessings. And, and so the setting here was that right after you know Jesus calls his disciples and begins having compassion on others that he sits down and, and he starts teaching and he starts talking about in the first part of Matthew 5 the, these Christian character traits these Christian characteristics that please God that are like uh, he wants us to be and so we talked last week about how those have corresponding blessings some some of those blessings are immediate. Some of them are in this life, but ultimately those things are fulfilled in eternity. And he's telling us that, that he is pleased when we act like he wants us to act. And, and even though we might think, well, this is a teaching not only to the, the closest disciples, but certainly there were some of the multitudes listening. And he gets right into to challenging things with them. He talked at the end of, of those verses in uh, verse 11 and 12 last week about how they could be persecuted for following him. How people will say evil things about them for, for following Jesus. And he tells them in verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then he immediately goes from there into this passage using metaphors about salt and light. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Again, he's, he's very practical in, in how we should live. So believer, as believers, we know that worshiping God is absolutely important, that we should come to church and we should worship Him. We should uh, have a church family that we can fellowship with and be encouraged by on Sunday morning. Some come because they're, they just love the Lord and there may not be anything in particular going on. But most people are going through some sort of struggle, uh, some sort of need in your own life. And you come for encouragement from the Word and for encouragement from other believers and come to, to pour your heart out to the Lord. But then there's this rest of the week. We're going to go home from church in a little while. And we, many of you will come back Wednesday night. Some won't come back till next Sunday. So there's this huge part of our lives that's not lived at church right in this environment in this environment we enjoy this freedom in america that we have to worship we can come and not hide our relationship in fear of some sort of persecution from the law or anything like that we can everyone can know that we're going to church we have that freedom we have that ability and we can sing songs of praise and we can pray and we can give and we can listen and we can respond and we can give all the glory to God. But when we're not here, that's where this passage really uh, impacts us today. The challenge of how do we live our lives? How are we as a person? How, how do other people perceive us and, and the people that know us best? In verse 13, he says, You are the salt of of the earth but if the salt loses its flavor how shall it be seasoned it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men so his first metaphor is salt he says to them you are the salt of the earth so for us reading that today he's talking to us he's looking at us still and saying you are the salt of the earth. So we think about that metaphor. Why did he use salt? Well, there are many uses for salt. Uh, nowadays, we have this wonderful thing called refrigeration. That didn't always exist. And so they used to take salt, and I say used to. I'm guessing that we may have somebody among us who has used it for this that did not have a refrigerator. I was amazed to meet one man at a church I served at in North Carolina, and he was only about 30 years older than me. 
And he said in his childhood they did not have an ice box. And he said they would take this meat and they would cover it in salt. And it would be out in a barn and they would throw a blanket over it. And that kept it from spoiling. That's hard to even imagine, isn't it? For some of us. For most of us. But it would be rubbed into meat. And it would slow the decay process. It would preserve it until it could be cooked and enjoyed and eaten. I'm not sure how long it was kept like that. But that's kind of the process before refrigeration. And so that's one of the things. And so we say, well, how does that apply to us? Well, it's not a real compliment if you look at your purpose to slow decay, is it? That's part of my job is to slow down the decay of this world. But think about that. If we are living the way God wants us to live, we will help slow down the decay in this world by the impact that we have, by being salt, by being involved. When we think about decay, we think, well, if it's decaying, then it can't be that that good right and so this is where some of the challenge the salt portion of this passage is kind of where some of the difficult things are addressed think about all the opportunities that we have in life to get involved in situations that are a little bit messy uh, with people that might be a little bit difficult with people that might be challenging or maybe it's not the people but just just the situation it's tough. And you say, well, you know, that's, that's messy. I'm dealing with, uh, you know, a sinful environment or whatever it might be. But that's where God wants us to be making a difference. He wants us to be involved in people's lives. And this may mean for you a lot of your time. It might mean a lot of your effort. Some of your money might be spent on people that, that you love or that you uh, come to know. Because they need help. And you're willing to, to be that help for them. It might be somebody with some sort of addiction. Or just continued problem in their life. And you're willing to get in there and slow down that decay. You're willing to be used of God as an instrument. To be salt. And so that's one of the things. Is to, is to slow decay or, or to preserve. And then it also is to... It's seasoning. That's probably the most common use that a lot of us think about. Uh, we still have it as a preservative. It's still in canned goods and things of that nature. But we think about sprinkling it on food because it enhances flavor. And so that's kind of an interesting, again, application for us as believers to say, I'm supposed to enhance the flavor of this world. It's supposed to be this world should be a better place because of believers, right? Because we are enhancing the flavor. We, we are a good additive where things are this way and then you add us into the mix and things get better. Better than they were without us. So again, we cannot escape this part of the metaphor with salt that we have to be actively um, communicating and living our lives amongst People, not just saved people, right? We have to be in this world. We have to know lost people. We have to be uh, in our relationships at home, at work, in, in society. We should know people that already aren't, you know, just have everything perfect. That there is a need for us to be involved in the lives of other people. So I just want to encourage us all to be open to those opportunities, to look for those opportunities and, and to recognize that God may have a specific reason that you came uh, to know somebody or, or came to be involved in a situation. One of the things in studying this that I really didn't realize about salt is that it's mixed uh, as part of fertilizer to promote growth. They would literally uh, mix it into the soil with other substances and it would make the soil more healthy for growth. I didn't realize that. And so that's the other thing. And so as believers, when we are a part of doing what God wants us to do, that by being salt, we, we can promote growth. We can make growth more possible. You think about those difficult situations or, or the, the slowing decay or the preserving. 
if we're involved and we're having an influence, then it can come from what may sound like something not so exciting like slowing decay or preserving to, wow, now we're talking about growth. We're talking about the opposite of decay. Now we're talking about growth because God allowed us to be a part of something that he was doing. And so whenever we have a metaphor like, like we are salt, it's natural for us to do what we've just done. Name, name some things that salt's used for and then say, well, how do we apply that to what Jesus is saying? And, and I think these words are important. Um, you know, that uh, one of the commentaries I was studying said that since salt had a varied use in the ancient world, Jesus is not pointing to only one application. He's using it in a broad sense, saying that we are a vital necessity for everyday life. That's the main point, is that we are vital. We are vital to the survival uh, of others. He wants us to be working on His behalf. And He says, you are the salt. You are necessary for the welfare of this world. Because you have opportunities to impact other people. You know so many people just in what you will do this week. That other people in here won't be there with you. Won't, won't know the same people. You might work different places. Have an impact on different people. But then he also talks about salt losing its flavor. Now... If we had any chemists in here, they might point out that that's chemically kind of impossible. That salt is very stable and it doesn't actually change. It, it stays the same. So what Jesus is talking about here is, is a purity. And that salt, when it's mixed in with other things, then obviously you're not going to put that on your food anymore because it's not pure anymore. The salt is still salt, but it's, it's dirty. It gets mixed with other things. And he says that it literally is good for nothing, but throw it out in the dirt. Let it be trampled underfoot by men. If the salt loses its flavor. It's been said that God will use a broken vessel, but he will not use a dirty one. And it speaks to our purity, our, our personal purity, our relationship with God. Our desire before Him to be clean. Now I know none of us, everyone can say, well, you know, that's impossible. Um, we can't be sinless on this earth. And, and that is true, that, that we are not sinless. And so when the Bible talks about us being holy, when it talks about personal purity, we need to make sure that we're not just dismissing those passages as something that only God can be, only Jesus can be, and so uh, I don't really need to listen to this part. No, he's talking about us, and he knows more than we do about our imperfections and uh, about our inability to be totally without sin and perfect. Yet, that's the calling, is to be holy, is to be like him. So he doesn't want us making exceptions for ourselves and go, well, you know, other than this, this, and that, you know, I'm doing pretty well. No, he wants us to, to honestly seek uh, a pure lifestyle so that we can be effectively used by God. And if we are doing that, then we're going to have more of these opportunities as, as we talked about what we can be as salt if we're trying to be pure and we're trying to be honest before God then we can be usable by God instead of what he said, good for nothing. And that has to do with our character, our, our reputation. So then he turns from the salt and he turns our attention in verse 14 on a different metaphor having to do with light. And again, he looks at them and says, you are the light of the world. Not just these few people over here, or say you are. All of you that are following Jesus are called to be the light of the world. He said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now this is back then when they were talking about just having like 
a lamp lit, but if you had a lot of populated population in a, in a small area, if every house had a small light and it was totally dark, you'd be able to see that, be able to pick up some sort of light. If you've ever had the uh, opportunity to fly into an airport at night, you could imagine what he's talking about now. Okay, if it's clear and you can see out the window of the plane and, and you look out the window at night and a lot of times you can't see anything. And then as they start talking about, you know, we're approaching, uh, please fasten your seatbelts and you start looking out the window, you can tell where, where that city is located. And it's, it's, you can't miss it. And so he's saying that this light is noticeable. He says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. A lot of these homes back then were, they were very small. Uh, many of the poor people had, had one room, and they had this, this lamp uh, made out of like a clay pot with a wick that they would pour oil in. And then because they only had this one little light, and because oil was costly, they didn't have all these different lights, they would put it on a lampstand so that it was kind of in the middle of the room and that one light is all that that one room home would have. He says, you know, this, this light is precious. You don't just light it and cover it up or blow it out. You'd light it and you'd, you'd put it on a lampstand so that everyone could benefit from that light. And so uh, it, was, it was highly uh, valued. And the other thing that we noticed from that is that a little light goes a long ways in the total darkness. Have you ever noticed that? If there's like a power outage, and you can feel just totally helpless when there's no light whatsoever. But you could light one candle. You are like, wow. You know, once your eyes adjust to it being dark, you're like that, that one little candle light, that if it was daylight, wouldn't even be really that noticeable. At night, it lights up this whole room. And that can be pretty amazing. So that ought to encourage us that we're called to be light. And, and instead of us saying, well, you know, God could use so many other people that are so much more talented than I am, so much more gifted, so much more influential, so many more leadership qualities inherent in their life than somebody like me. He wants us to recognize. He didn't say... Those of you with the most human talent and ability are the light of the world. He said to all believers, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus himself Talked about him being the light. In John eight twelve, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And that's what he's talking about spiritually is that because of us, because believers exist and we're in this world and we're being salt and we're being light, people do not have to walk in darkness. Walking in the dark is scary. It's, it's painful. You... It's dangerous. But walking in the light, he wants specifically people to know about the hope that's only found in Jesus Christ. And so as we get involved in other people's lives, we're not only being a good example, we're also telling them about Jesus, telling them about the gospel, telling them how they too can know Jesus. They too can be saved. Let your light so shine. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. And he says before men. So, it lets us know that we cannot live lives secluded from society, protected from all the evil influences of the world, and claim that we're being obedient to God. I mean, it's very possible 
You think about how things have changed over the, over the decades, just even the way that, that homes are, have been built the last 30 years. Okay, it used to be that homes had prominent front porches and that backyards were not fenced. And neighbors used to talk to each other and all that. But nowadays, the typical way that homes are built and that, that we behave is as we're approaching our home, we hit the little button, a little door goes up, pull the car in, hit the little button, door goes down, go inside, and if the doorbell rings, your first thought is not a good one. Somebody is trying to sell something. You know, that's, that's just the way it is, isn't it? I mean, in our society and culture. And so it's easy to kind of think that way that, well, society's kind of messy, you know. Uh, people are kind of difficult. And I've already been at work today. And now I'm, I'm at home. And let's just, you know, stay inside these walls, stay inside this home. I don't want to go out there. And I understand that. And I understand I have people knock on my door that want stuff just like you do. And I understand that. But what I'm talking about more is just our openness to being used of the Lord. Our openness to interact with people. Interact with people that are needy and, and that require time and attention and love and resources. Because they're valued by God. Because they're worth it. So we have to interact with other people in a positive way. And he also says, you know, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Not just hear about it, right? Like nobody wants to just hear about how good we are or hear us talking about other things. They, they should witness it. If, you, if your co-workers are lost, they may not just say, oh, I want to go to church with you. But they ought to be able to see that you're a good employee. That, that you are one of the good people at work that's helping make your work a better place. That you are, are loyal, that you're faithful, that you're diligent. They need to see our good works and what we do. But we also do need to use our mouths and, and tell people about Jesus and give God the glory. He says... That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, how are they going to know that God gets the glory unless you are sharing with them with your mouth that I'm, I'm accountable to God for my work? You may even have somebody come over and say, why are you working that hard? The boss is not watching and you're making the rest of us uncomfortable. Oh, I wasn't trying to make you all uncomfortable. I, I'm paid to do a job and God is watching me and I want to I be a good steward. You know, I want to be found faithful. I'm glad I have this job and I, and I don't want to lose it and I want to bring glory to God in, in all that I do. And then they might think differently when they see you working. Oh, she's not trying to outwork us. She's working for the Lord. It's a whole different mindset. It's a, it's a whole different attitude or whatever we are doing. That they would see what we are doing, but instead of giving us the glory, they say, well, that's God. You know, that, that person is working uh, to glorify Him. So this is the way that we live on a, on a consistent daily basis. That's the challenge here. This would include the conversations that we have. You know, the words that come out of our mouth and... And nowadays, as we apply the Bible to today, all of the scripture that's about our language, how we speak, about the controlling the tongue, you know, we've always been able to, to apply it to gossip and slander and cussing and bad-mouthing and things of that nature. But we have to include it now in all forms of communication, including social media. I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody that I know that claims to follow Christ put stuff on their Facebook page that their parents, grandparents, siblings, 
children see? Just foul language. Uh, things that if you said in a conversation you should be ashamed of. But to instead think about it and say, you know, I want to post this. I, this represents me. Because everybody said something they regret and they say, oh boy, I shouldn't have said that. But to think about it, to, to type it or text it or whatever and put it out there and say, I want this language on my page for everybody to see. Oh, and my next post is, are you coming to church this morning? Or some sort of God meme or something like that. And it's like, wait a second. Is this the same person? And to take that into account of, am I being light? Or am I being a little contradictory and confusing? Is my, is my friend that's thinking about being saved going to see this and go, wow, they seem to be messed up more than me. I don't, I don't really think that's probably good. I don't want that. But our interactions with others, people are watching. And we need to be an example. And this also, as we talk about salt and light, instead of just light, it reminds us of the difficulties of almost everything that we do in life. Have you ever noticed that almost every single role in life has a negative aspect or at least a challenging aspect that is not as enjoyable as maybe some other things. Let's, as an example, say parenting. Okay, so parenting is awesome. We get kids. We get to we get to raise kids, and you say, "Oh, well, I want to be a good parent." Okay, well, what what is involved in being a good parent? Is it just playing in the park? And having picnics. Oh, to, to play in the park and have picnics, you have to do a lot of other stuff, don't you, to get there. A lot of daily things. And um, at the beginning, you may think, oh, well, that's just, you know, diapers and spit up and all that kind of stuff. But later, you're like, well, wait a minute. If I want kids that honor the Lord, then they're going to need some sort of discipline. Some sort of correction. And boy, as a parent, I really think that's one of the, one of the balances that, that we seek that you, you never quite know if you've got it right. You know, you're always praying, God, how much is too much? How, am I being too strict? Am I, am I being too lenient? Because, you know, as a kid, being punished is no fun, is it? Getting your rights stripped away or whatever it might be, getting, losing freedoms. But as a parent... It's no fun, is it? It hurts as a parent to, to pour out discipline. And you think, well, that's part of parenting, isn't it? It's a part that cannot be avoided. So you think, well, to be a parent, which is a great thing and a blessing, I've got to also, sometimes I have to be the bad guy, you know, to, to my son or daughter, and that's, that's not fun. What about work? You know, work can be fun. I mean... If we have to work a lot, you're going to spend a lot of hours at work looking at these teenagers. You're going to work a lot of hours in your life. So have fun doing it. You know, you can have fun while you're at work. But there's some things, you can't just go to work and be a, a class clown, can you? There are things that have to be done. Little things that just aren't that enjoyable, you know. Little details. You're like, well, maybe I could just kind of ignore that. And, you know, that's no fun. I mean, that's just so tedious. But if you don't do those little things that you know are part of your responsibility, eventually it's going to catch up. And somebody's going to pay the price. It, it might be you. It might be your business. But to say, you know what? It's a, it's a, I'm happy to be an employee. I'm glad that I have good coworkers. But there's these parts of my job that aren't as fun, they might even just bore people if they knew that you had to do them. You're like, that's important. It's, it's important stuff. And what he's talking about here is some of these things that are part of being a Christian. Being a Christian is awesome. 
There's nothing better than knowing that my sins are forgiven and that I get to go be with Jesus forever. But boy, the stuff he talked about with the salt, that reminds me that there's work to do. And that's part of being a Christian. And that it's not always clean and easy and fun. Sometimes it's really messy and hard and discouraging. And we wish that maybe somebody else would have that job. But he said, you are the salt. You are the salt of the earth. And then there's a challenge in that to remain pure, to remain morally upright. And along with that challenge, to maintain a good attitude. You know, to maintain a good attitude even when we're doing that salty work that we've been called to do. One of the expositors Bible commentary said it like this. It said, if salt exercises the negative function of delaying decay and warns disciples of the danger of compromise and conformity to the world, then light speaks positively of illuminating a sin-darkened world and warns against a withdrawal from the world that does not lead others to glorify the Father in heaven. Warns against withdrawal from the world. That is a tendency that we need to be aware of. It's not unique to you. It's not a temptation that's unique to you. It is, it is a normal tendency for people to say, well, I want to advance enough in life so that things get a little easier for me. I'll work hard now so that I can have some sort of retirement so that I can quit doing this hard job and live in a gated property and never leave. I'll just have everything delivered. Which you could actually do now. But Jesus says no. He wants us to be out and about. Wants us to be salt. Wants us to be light. Wants us to be part of this world. So he's issuing a challenge for us. To be a necessary part of preserving and slowing decay. Of flavoring. Of, of making life better. Of illuminating. Of sharing the love of Jesus. And all this involves... What we do every day. Just who are we? And sometimes it's good to have some reflection and say, well, you know, what parts about me don't I like? You know, hey, God, what, what do I need to do to be more effective for you? Am I, am I hiding? Am I alone too much? Am I willing to talk to people? Am I willing to have relationships? And what kind of impact might I be having on people when I do that? Am, am I positive? Am I, am I a adding flavor? Am I preserving? Am I illuminating? Or am I casting darkness or promoting decay? Say, God, boy, how many to, how many to take this from you as a challenge and, and as a way to really um, be more like you? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge issued to be salt and light. Lord, it's not easy. It's easy for us to be discouraged. It's easy for us to say, boy, that was time wasted or that didn't work out positively like I wanted. But God, that doesn't mean that it was wasted. It doesn't mean that it was a failure. We're going to invest so many hours and resources in people and we don't always see fruit from that. But God, it's about our obedience. About, it's about us being willing to be involved. It's about us representing you daily. So God, we just pray right now for this invitation time that if there's somebody here today that doesn't know you personally, God, that wants to know you, to, that wants to be saved, that wants to be forgiven of their sins, we pray that you give them the boldness as we're going to stand and sing one song together, that they would come up and speak to Brother Brandon or myself and just say, hey, I'll... I want to be saved, or I have a question about how to be saved. God, there may be something in this message about the salt of the light that convicted someone in this room, maybe that convicted everyone in this room, myself included, over ways that we could be more like you. God, it's a time for us to either stay where we're at and pray to you about that, make commitments to you, and, and ask for forgiveness where we failed. 
or to come up to these steps and just bow and, and pray. Lord, we pray that you would work during this time. Lord, I'm going to ask one other thing during this invitation time. It's not going to be a long invitation, so we need to respond quickly when this prayer is over. God, we have a lot of needs in our church family. It's always that way, but it just seems uh, some extra burdens right now. We have many people that are going through health challenges. Some that have already had surgery, some that are going into surgery. Uh, some that uh, are having difficulties at work or financially or in relationships or whatever that might be. God, we need to pray. We need to pray to you. And I'm going to ask that people come and pray today for specific things. I'm going to ask that somebody would come and pray for, for Reagan in the hospital. She needs to be able to eat, to keep food down, to gain weight so that she can go into this heart surgery healthy, strong. For uh, Miss Carol Curtis, who's in the hospital right now and, and going to have a heart test tomorrow, God, I would ask that somebody would come pray for her. God, there's many other needs. This wasn't intended to list all of them, but God, we know what they are. So if you know of a need, somebody that needs uh, healed, touched, helped, encouraged, I would ask that you would come pray for them right now. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.